Hi, we'd like to welcome you to another in a series of webinars designed for public transit agencies. I'm Terry Bills, and I'm the Transportation Industry Manager here at Esri. And today we have Jay Hagen, a solution engineer at Esri, uh, to talk about how a number of tools and techniques in Esri software can help public transit agencies make better decisions within their organizations. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to point out that we are recording this webinar, and while everyone will be on mute, uh, there will be time for question and answers at the end of the presentation. So you can type your questions into the question box, and we'll try to answer uh, as many as time allows. Yeah. And additionally, the slides which are part of this webinar will be available to you on the GeoNet Group Departments of Transportation, uh, and they'll uh, be posted later today. So uh, to begin with, uh, let me uh, let me start uh, by more formally introducing uh, this webinar series. And we've already had several of these public transit webinars, and you can find some of those past ones on our website. And our plan is to uh, rotate between a more technical topic and then uh, to a more substantive topic. And, Really, the goal is to better familiarize everyone, not only with the technology, uh, but also with the very substantial and uh, many very creative ways in which uh, GIS is being used to support public transit and our understanding of our changing uh, mobility patterns. So, so um, as an example, at the end of uh, this month, we do have another webinar uh, from one of our partners, which really does address uh, some of those, uh, uh, how we understand those changing mobility patterns. And we encourage you to sign up for that webinar uh, and all future webinars in the series. And uh, certainly if you have any ideas uh, for topics that you would like to see covered in the future, uh, we would certainly welcome your suggestions. And then finally, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the upcoming Esri UC uh, in San Diego. Besides a series of tracks dedicated to public transit, uh, we also have a special interest group, uh, which will be held on uh, Wednesday at uh, lunchtime. So we encourage you uh, all to attend uh, both the SIG as well as the sessions. So uh, next at Esri, uh, we do take it as a given that solving our mobility problems um, is probably the central challenge for most cities around the world. And uh, most of the cities that I visit are experiencing rapidly increasing levels of congestion, uh, which generally has a significant impact not only on accessibility, but really on our overall quality of life. Uh, so I often say, I think it's a given that you cannot be a smart city without solving your mobility issues. And I think that's true worldwide and really remains one of our greatest challenges. Uh, that said, I think everyone on this uh, webinar also believes that uh, public transit is gonna have to play a central role in solving those mobility challenges. So uh, in terms of the subject today, uh, public transit agencies all generally share the same challenges uh, in the context of the rapid changes in most of our cities. Uh, how do we provide the optimal service at the most efficient cost? How do we achieve high levels of customer service and satisfaction? And how do we maximize ridership, accessibility, uh, and equity all with the lowest subsidy. And I think if you can succeed on those measures, I think you're a long way uh, towards solving uh, many of your larger mobility issues. Uh, but with that introduction, let me turn it over to Jay Hagen, uh, who is going to uh, show us a number of uh, applications. Uh, and Jay, take it away. Thanks, Terry. So yeah, today we're gonna to talk a lot about doing spatial analysis. And I'm gonna draw on some experiences that I had uh, prior to working at Esri. So before I became a solution engineer at Esri, um, I worked for the transit agency in St. Louis and I did GIS there and I was often tasked with doing various types of analysis. Um, so I'm gonna draw on some of those experiences but show you how you can leverage some tools that I didn't have available to me then uh, so we're going to leverage the geospatial cloud and web gis uh, to do some 
some quick analysis. We have access to a lot of data uh, through cloud resources now. I say quick analysis, but very powerful analysis. So I'm gonna walk through a few different scenarios and show how we can leverage some of these tools to, to do our job. So I'm really excited to do this. I, I really think that having some of these web, cap web capabilities and doing spatial analysis is really some of the fun stuff that we really get to do with GIS. So I'm gonna walk through um, selecting a site for a new transit center. And this is something that an exercise I went through in my time in St. Louis, we were trying to site a new transit center. We had a few different candidate sites and we wanted to look at some, uh, some, some various demographics and other uh, factors to determine which site would be best for our transit center. Uh, after we select that uh, transit site, we wanna be able to market our new transit center to new prospective customers. So I'll show you how you can use some of these tools to reach out to your customer base. Um, related to that, after we selected a transit center, we had to redesign all of our routes. So I'll show you how you can use some tools to evaluate new service and do some quick comparisons between your existing service and your proposed service. That could be related to a Title VI report or it could just be um, some metrics that you want to run internally to, to evaluate the types of changes you're making. And finally, uh, we'll kind of switch gears and we'll take a look at how to prioritize some uh, bus stop improvements. So, you know, a lot of our agencies have thousands of bus stops. We need to make various improvements, whether it's for ADA compliance or maybe you want to add shelters or just improve the stop. Um, how, how can we prioritize which stops to do? So with that, I'm gonna dive in now. So we're gonna start with siting a new transit center. So here I am in my, uh, I'm logged into my ArcGIS online portal. So you can see here, I've, I've got my identity, I'm, I've signed in. So now I have access to various tools that are made available to me. So I'll go to my app selector here. And for this part of the demonstration, I'm gonna, going to be using Business Analyst Online. Um, Business Analyst Online is a, is a premium addition to ArcGIS Online. Uh, you could also be using Community Analyst Online. These two I often get asked, what is the difference between Business Analyst Online and Community Analyst Online? The answer is this one's blue when you open it. This one used to be green when you open it, but it's blue now too. So there's really not much difference at all. <laughs> they're, they're actually the same thing. So if you have Community Analyst, you could do this exact same workflow that I'm about to do. So let's launch Business Analyst Online. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm within a web browser here, and you'll probably notice that everything I do today, I'm gonna be in a web browser. I'm not actually opening any uh, desktop software. So I'm in Business Analyst, I'm logged in, and I'm gonna create a new project. I'm gonna start a new project. Uh, we'll give it a name, so we'll call it Transit Center Site Selection. We'll create this project, and while that's pulling together various resources for me. Uh, let's take a look at our candidate sites. So first off, I wanna point out, this is just a demonstration. If there's somebody from St. Louis on here and you're looking at this list, you're saying, well, that wasn't the cost and th those aren't the sites. That isn't the goal here. I, I created some, some mocked up some data here so that this isn't necessarily real. But the way that this worked for me in the past was we had a few candidate sites and that we're looking at our six candidate sites here. Uh, we have their location. Uh, we know how large those sites are, and we knew how much it cost to acquire that property, and then how much it was going to cost to prepare that property to be a transit center. So from that, we have a total cost. So two of the things we wanted to look at, we wanted, obviously, the, the, the cheaper the land, the better. And then we also had kind of an ideal size for property, and we were shooting for around six acres. We thought that would be a good, uh, good size of a, of a plot for us to create our transit center. So this is an Excel spreadsheet, but I'm gonna leverage that within Business Analyst Online. So I'm gonna close this, I don't, I don't need to use this. Okay, and my project is now ready. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add data. I'm going to add that spreadsheet so I can import that file. I'll browse for it. And I'll select the Excel spreadsheet and I will import it. So here it's going to pull the address, the city and state to geocode those locations for me. I don't need to cluster these points that found all six locations. Here we can verify we have the right ones on the map. I can look at that and see that that is correct. 
and I will apply that. So it's creating a new layer for me from that Excel spreadsheet. So now, let's close some of this. I can interact with these points, I can click on it, I can see some of the information that comes from the Excel spreadsheet, but now I have this interactive uh, layer that I can use. So as I said, what we want to do is we want to evaluate these six sites and figure out which one would be the best for our new transit center. So for that, I'm going to come here and create maps from data. And we have this suitability analysis tool. So I'm going to select this. And now it's asking me, well, what sites do you want to evaluate? Well, we already have features on a map, so I'm going to start with those. Here's my six sites. I'll verify that all of those are checked. We're going to evaluate all six of those. And now it's asking for some type of a geography around those sites that we want to evaluate. Since this is a transit center, I'm going to assume that we want people to be able to walk to this location. So I'm interested in some of the uh, demographics and other information around uh, walkability here. And I want to look at, I'm going to put in a 10, a 15, and a 20 minute walk time around each one of these sites. We'll create that. So here it's reaching out using web tools, and now we can visualize what a, a 20, 15, and 10 minute walk time looks like around each one of these sites. So again, doing this in a web browser, very quick, very easy. I didn't have to use any network analyst tools and desktop and, and, and work with all of that. I, I could just leverage some of these web resources to, to look at this very quickly. So now I have my six um, evaluation sites. Now what I need to do is I need to come up with my evaluation criteria. So there's really kind of two parts to this in my mind. Uh, we want to be able to evaluate some of the metrics about the site itself. And then that, by that I mean the cost of the site and the acreage of the site. Then we also want to look at some of the demographics around the site coming from these various walk times. So I need to incorporate all that criteria here. So let's add criteria. And let's add some attributes from the site itself. So this is looking back at the information from the Excel spreadsheet. I'm going to grab the acreage. I'm going to grab the total cost. So those are two of the criteria I want. And I want these two criteria to make up about 50% of the input here. I want the other 50% to come from some other information from the data around the site. So let's add some more criteria and let's reach out to our data browser. So with our data browser here, we have access to hundreds of different data layers that we can use for this type of evaluation. So one thing that I want to look at here would be at-risk populations. So I can browse through these categories. We have at-risk. And here I want to look at, I'm going to select poverty. So the number of households below poverty level, I think that's important. I also want to look at vehicle availability. So let's grab the number of households with no vehicle. That's a good measurement of, of potential transit use. Um, let's also do a search here. I'm going to search for public transportation. So if I don't know which category, but I have an idea of what I'm looking for, I could just do a search. That's what I'm doing here. And here we have journey to work information from, from the ACS. So this would be the number of workers who are using transportation. That's another good one to have. And finally, um, I want some information about employment around these sites. So not only would I be drawing folks that might want to walk here, but this transit center could be kind of a depot for people going to work as well. It'd be good to know what, uh, what the job situation is around here. So I can go to my business data and I'll add the total number of employees. So I have four variables selected. I will apply that. And now my list is going to update. I will have the two factors coming from the site itself and then the four variables coming from, uh, from our online resources. So let's close this out. We'll zoom out a little bit. So we can kind of see we're looking at the North County area of St. Louis. The city of St. Louis is down here. Here's all of our sites. And then this is going to be the result of our suitability analysis. But what I need to do is I need to come in here and I want to weight each one of these criteria separately. And I also need to make some changes here. So for the acreage, by default, it's using a positive influence. And that means the higher the value, the higher the score. Well, that's not necessarily true. We have an ideal site size in mind. We want something roughly 
six acres. So I can drag this over here, and we'll put it right about there as our ideal site size. And again, I want this to be, I want the cost in the acreage to make up about half the weight. So I'm gonna weigh this at 25% and lock that in. For the total cost, again, we need to make a change. The more expensive it is, right now it's showing it as more, uh, as, as a uh, more sought out site, but that's not true. We want the inverse. The lower the value, the higher the score. So we'll put the inverse there. We'll weigh this at 25 and we'll lock that in. You might notice as I'm making these changes, it's changing the order of these sites. So it's doing this dynamically. Okay, so now for our demographics here. So for the households below poverty level, I'm gonna set this at 15% weight, lock that in. Zero vehicle households and workers that use public transportation. These two are probably pretty closely related. If you don't have a car, there's a decent chance you're using public transportation. So combined, I want these to make up about 25% of my uh, evaluation criteria. So to do that, I'm gonna remember we have 50% between these four uh, criteria. This is at 15. So I'm gonna set the total employment at 10%, lock that in. And then what this will do is it will split the remaining 25% between these two. So it's showing 13, but it's 12 and a half percent for each one of these. And with that, of course, you could change these uh, based on what you think it might be at different criteria and so forth. But now we have a good idea of, of what we should be looking at here. So based on our 20 minute walk time here, I'll zoom in a little bit here. It's showing that the clock tower has a final score of 0.86. And the way this, this final score works is the closer to one, the more ideal the site is based on what you've selected here. So just kind of looking at this list, we have about four sites here that are actually really good candidates. In other words, 0.75 or above for four of these sites. A couple of other of these sites, this Jamestown Mall one here ends up with a zero, so that's probably not a good site at all. This one's coming in at 0.5. Um, and then we could change this to look at the other um, service areas. We look at a 15 minute, when we go to 15 minute, it changes a little bit. Uh, Cross Keys is now our top one, Clock Tower dropped at three, but we could still say that three of these are still great candidates. And then again, looking at 10 minute, uh, Clock Tower jumps back up again, it's a 0.8. Uh, we, we still have three strong candidates. So based on that, we could probably say there's three candidates we should investigate more closely. So with that, um, we probably would come to the conclusion that maybe Clock Tower is our, our best site. That's the one we want to choose. Let, let's investigate that. So uh, we want to come up with some supporting documentation for that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to export this analysis to Excel. I'll open this up. And then this is now just a spreadsheet that we could pass off to decision makers or whoever needs to see this supporting documentation. This has all of those variables in there that we looked at, their score, the weight, et cetera. Um, another thing we might wanna do is just do some comparisons here. Uh, we maybe compare this to some other sites. So we can go in, uh, we can select the clock tower site here. We could look at comparisons, comparison reports. And right now, by default, it grabs the site you selected and then compares it to some of the geography around there. But what we might wanna do is compare it to some of the other sites. So we can look at sites on the map. We'll select all of these sites. And now we can quickly compare these six sites to our candidate site, looking at things like population. Um, and of course, we can add all of those other variables um, from the data browser. Um, there's some default reports, so if I want to look at an income comparison, I can pull that up. Of course, I can export this out to a spreadsheet as well. Since we have now selected our site and we're going to go with Clock Tower, um, I probably want to put together a sheet that I can hand off to our decision makers so that they have just some quick facts about the site uh, to help them make the decision. So I'm going to select the site again, and I'm going to come into Infographics. And this is going to put together a really nice infographic for me that I can then share 
with whoever really needs to see this, whether it's our real estate group who's gonna be purchasing the site, maybe the public, we need to talk to them about uh, why we chose this site, or again, decision makers might need to see this. So by default, it comes up with this nice demographic summary. But again, like the other reports, there's a number of other reports and infographics I could choose from here. Or you can create your own infographic, which is what I've done here. I've created the site selection infographic. So I'm gonna pull that in. Yes, again, assembling data from a number of different sources, um, including the site itself and then some of the demographic information. So here's my infographic that I created. We can see the site, we can see the uh, kind of the 10 minute walk area that we're studying here, um, some demographic information right uh, here. We're looking at race, journey to work information. We have a photo of the site, some key demographics, and then some of the site details are in here as well. That's coming from the site. So the, the total cost, the, the address, et cetera, some information about the name of the location, who to contact. So now that I've created this infographic, I could share this and make it available to other users who are using business analysts, or in this case, I'm going to export this out. I could create a PDF and then I would have something I could print or email to somebody, or I could even create some dynamic HTML, which is, I think, pretty nifty. So what this does is it creates basically a web page that you could then host on your website that mimics the look of this infographic. So it's now assembling that information, and here it is, we can take a look at it. This is hosted locally, but I could just throw this on a web server and then have this infographic available to anyone. And because it's web-based, it's interactive. So that's really great. Okay, so now we've come up um, with our site. We have assembled some supporting documentation around it. Uh, we're, ready, we're ready to, to roll with that. Once we've created our transit center, we've built our transit center, one thing we might want to do is be able to market this to prospective customers now. So again, let's select this site and let's create a report for this area. And there's a number of different reports I can choose from here, but one of them that is really great for marketing purposes is this tapestry segmentation profile. So I'm gonna select that. I'm going to run that report. We'll give this a second to run. So again, this is assembling information. I can now open the report. And what the tapestry segmentation profile does is, um, well, I should take a step back. Esri has a demographics team that is dedicated to just assembling this kind of information. And they take demographic information from various sources, whether the census or ACS or Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics, and they created this tapestry segmentation. So they divided the entire country up into various types of uh, neighborhoods or segments. And I, I think there's close to 60 different neighborhood types. Um, and what this is showing you is the predominant neighborhood type in this report. So I can scroll through here and I can see some information so, uh, about, about some of these different types of neighborhoods. But for this one, the predominant neighborhood type is what we refer to as retirement communities. So I can click on that. And then this gives me a report of what the typical retirement community looks like. So this tells you kind of who they are. Um, they're kind of all over the country. It's single family and independent living with apartments. Uh, some of the neighborhood stock, household size, some of the socioeconomic traits. Um, so this is all things that are very useful if, if you maybe work in communications or marketing. Here's some of the demographic information about these types of households, again, that's important to look at, but I think what we might want to look at here is the market profile, because we're trying to, to encourage people to use this new transit center. How do we reach out to these folks? So um, just looking through this, um, they prefer watching cable TV, including premium channels. They like to travel and they shop at retail places like this. So this gives us some idea about where we might want to do some of our marketing. So maybe we would reach out to the local cable TV network and do some TV advertising there. Or maybe we would look to go some type of a magazine, something like that. So this gives us a lot of good information. This shows us where these types of communities are throughout the country. But again, this is just a, a really quick and easy way to come up with, with a nice profile of the community you're trying to reach out to. 
Okay, so with that, we have now evaluated our sites, we've chosen a site, and we're now marketing. We've figured out how or who to market this new transit center to. Uh, after, in, in, in my role in St. Louis, after we created the site, we redesigned all of our transit routes. So we had this new transit center, we needed to redesign the bus service in that area. So I'd like to show you how you could use this same tool, Business Analyst Online or Community Analyst on, Online, to do a route evaluation. So for that, I'm going to create a new project so that way we kind of clear everything out. We'll call this Route Eval. And we're creating a new project. This will clear out my map and I can start fresh. So while that's opening, usually whenever I was looking at uh, a, you know, looking at a route evaluation. Um, one of the planners would usually just hand me off a shape file, and that's what I have here. This is the shape file that I've zipped up. This has the existing route in it, and it has the proposed new route in it. So, in order to work with this route, I can take this shape file and web enable it. So let's let's do that. For that, I'm going to jump back out to ArcGIS Online. And I'm going to open a map. And I'm going to add that shape file. So here I can add data from a number of different sources. I'm going to add a layer from the web. Here you can see that a zip shape file is one of the types we can add. I'll grab that zip shape file, open that, and we will import this layer now. So this is going to take that static shape file. And now it's web enabled. And let's just I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. These two routes overlap. And again, if there's somebody from St. Louis here who's saying, well, that's, that's not real. Again, this is just data that I've mocked up. So the existing route is actually much longer than the proposed route. What we're going to do is at our new transit center here, we're going to kind of split up the routes and have a number of, of routes uh, kind of using a, a, a spoke system here. So here I have my two routes. I can visualize those. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up with a, a service area around these two routes. So I'm going to come in here to my route layer. We will analyze the proximity. And I'm going to create a buffer around this. And I'm going to do a three-quarter mile buffer around these two routes. And make sure all of my parameters are set correctly and run that. So again, I can be using WebGIS to, to do something. If, if you're a GIS person, creating a buffer is pretty simple, but um, some folks don't have access to desktop software. Maybe they're unfamiliar with how to use desktop software. We can use WebGIS to do a lot of this, this type of analysis right within a browser. Okay, so that is finished running. Here's the, the two different buffers. So you can see our proposed and our existing route. Uh, we can go ahead and style this so we can clearly see that. So we have a red and a blue, one overlaps the other. And I'm going to now save this map. Call it route evaluation. Give it a tag and save the map. So now I've saved this, and because this is WebGIS, I can now access this map and other uh, web applications. So I can go back to my business analyst now. My project is, is now ready. Let's uh, clear everything out of here. And let's add data. And this time, um, instead of importing the file, it's already a web map. So we can go to our web maps and we'll search for route. Here's our route evaluation map. We'll add that. And here we can see the two buffers. So we have our uh, proposed and also 
the existing route. So uh, again, what I want to do here is do a comparison. So I'm going to go into my uh, comparison report here. And I'm not sure why this didn't clear out my previous, uh, still showing our site selection. I, I don't think I changed projects. So we'll, we'll just live with this for now. So we still have our sites that we used before. Uh, but we can bring in our, our two different uh, buffers here. So we'll go to add sites from layers, our two features and apply that. So here's our two uh, proposed routes. And then we can also bring in some other uh, demographic information that we might be interested in. So I'll add some variables and I want to look at poverty, We'll look at households below poverty level. And I want a percentage of that. Clear out some of these other variables. I also want to look at public transportation use. Percentage of folks using public transportation. And then uh, we will also look at minority populations. I'll search for minority. And here we have minority population from the US Census. I'll select that and apply. This is updated. And I didn't name these appropriately, but this is actually our um, existing route. This is our proposed route. And here you can see, based on percentage, we're actually serving a higher proportion of what I would say are transit dependent customers, a higher minority population, a higher percentage of folks that are using public transportation, and a higher uh, proportion of folks that are below the poverty line. So our new route, even though it's shorter, is really um, getting at the target population that we're looking at. And in reality, what you would want to do is bring in all of the routes for that area and evaluate all of those. But for purposes of this demonstration, I wanted to keep it fairly simple so that we could get through it quickly. That's how you could evaluate two different routes there pretty quickly. And then again, we can export this information out and we'll have a spreadsheet that then of course we, we can use for further evaluation if need be or to support, uh, create supporting documentation for a report. Okay, so that's kind of going through the, the workflow of what I'm going to say is a, a system redesign for selecting a new transit center and marketing it to new customers and then evaluating the routes uh, that you're going to be changing around that transit center. So now what I want to do is I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I want to show you how you can use some of these tools to prioritize bus stop improvements. So I'm going to close this out. I'm going to go back here to my app selector. And for this, I'm going to be using Insights to do this analysis. So Insights is a really great tool for do, doing data exploration, especially if you have big data sets. But you can also use Insights to do some analysis and help you make some data-driven decisions. So if you were on one of our previous uh, transit webinars, I believe it was our first one, I showed how you can uh, use some of our field data collection tools to evaluate your bus stops to see if they're ADA compliant. So the thought is, you've gone out in the field, you've evaluated all your stops, and now you know which ones are and aren't ADA compliant. And what you want to do is get the stops that are not ADA compliant up to that uh, level of ADA standard. Um, however, at least in my experience, you probably don't have enough money or resources to improve all of your stops. You need to prioritize which stops uh, to start on. So this is what this exercise is going to go through. So I'm gonna open up this workbook. And this time we're looking at um, some bus stops and this, this is in the Denver area. So I'm gonna give the same uh, message here that if there's somebody from Denver in here and you're looking at this and saying, well, this isn't our real data, it's, it's not real data. This is data that I've mocked up for purposes of this demonstration. So these are all of the bus stops we have. So I can look at this. There's almost 9,000 bus stops. But again, I'm not interested in every single bus stop. 
I need to look at those that aren't ADA compliant because I want to figure out which ones I should improve. So I'm going to come over here and from our field data collection, we now have um, some information about which stops are ADA accessible. So I'm going to select no, it's not ADA accessible and apply that filter. And now we can look at this. Now we're dealing with 2,500 stops. Way too many stops for us to improve this year. Uh, we would probably want to get under, I'm going to say 100 that we could really focus on for the coming year and, and work off of that. So let's let's go through some uh, prioritization here. The first thing I'm going to do, let's just change this up so it's a little bit easier to look at. And I'm going to change the base map. Okay, so these are the stops that we want to focus on. Um, let's think about ways that we can uh, prioritize this. So the first thing I thought of is we might want to focus on stops that are transfer points. They're going to be used more often. Folks are going to be getting off a bus, waiting there, and then transferring to another bus. Those would be good stops to prioritize. However, just kind of looking here at my list of attributes, and I can even open the data table here. There's nothing in here that indicates that a stop is a transfer point. However, we do have a field right here that lists the routes served by that stop. So what we could do is we could think of a way to try to select those stops that serve multiple routes. That might not make it a transfer point necessarily because it's completely plausible that two routes run down the same street and they're not necessarily transferring between the two. But I think this would be a good proxy. So let's come back here. Let's go to the route attribute. And we need to create a filter here that accounts for multiple routes. Well, there's no way to just select multiple routes. So what I'm going to do is deselect all of these. And then for the search value, I'm going to put in a comma. And now what this list is showing me is all of those that have a comma in it. And the only ones that have commas are routes that serve or stops that serve multiple routes. So let's select all of these. Hold down shift. I'll be able to check all of those and apply that. And now let's take a look. So now we're down to 562 bus stops that serve multiple routes. And again, uh, these might not necessarily be transferred, but some of them certainly are. These are probably good stops to, to start with, though. But again, that's still too large of a number for us to work with. So we want to take a look at some other things here. So let's bring in some data from some outside sources. So I can add data, and I can add data from my online portal. I can bring in information from an Excel spreadsheet. Um, or in this case, I'm going to browse the Living Atlas. So the Living Atlas is data that's been curated by Esri that comes from Esri and other trusted data sources. And when I was looking through some of this data, I found this really great layer put out by the Centers for Disease Control. So I'm going to bring that layer up. So I'm going to search for CDC SVI. And the SVI is the Social Vulnerability Index. So they put together uh, this layer that looks at, very, I think it's 15 different demographic factors and assigns a value to each census tract based on their social vulnerability. So I want to add this layer. I'm going to pull that in. And while that's coming up, here I'll just show you this. So this is from the CDC. It's the Social Vulnerability Index. And they have four different themes here um, for, for this uh, SVI. Uh, theme one is socioeconomic. Theme two is household. Theme three is race um, and language. And then theme four, which is the one we're interested in, is focused on housing and transportation needs. So the idea is the higher your index is, the closer it is to one, the higher your transportation and housing needs are. This is really designed to be used in disaster, but I think we can use the same information here because this is giving a good idea of folks that have high transportation needs. So theme four is the one we're interested in. So this data has been added, it created a map for me, I don't need that. So this is the SVI information. This is for the entire country, it's a lot of data to work with. So the first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna filter this down and just look at Colorado. 
So I'm not looking at the, at the entire country. And I'm going to drag this over here so we can visualize it as a layer. We'll zoom back in. Now there's a lot of orange on the map, so let's change how this looks. We'll make this kind of a pink here. And let's go purple. All right, so now we can see those census tracts. So now what I want to do is I want to get at those census tracts that have the highest SVI for transportation and housing. So what I need to do now is filter on theme four. So we'll scroll through here. There's a lot of information in here. They have all the factors that they look at. And let's see if we can find it. RPL theme four. So this is the one we're interested in. We're going to filter on that. And I'm going to filter for census tracts that have an RPL between 0.65 and 1. Those are the higher, higher needs. A lot of these numbers are negative. I think that's based on um, probably some populations of zero and so forth. Um, so we'll put in zero, put in zero, 0.65, hit enter, apply that. So now in purple, and some of these are hard to see, those tracks are small. Those are those tracks that have um, a housing and transportation index between 0.65 and one high, higher need there. So what I wanna do with this information now is I need to extract those bus stops that are there. So let's take this layer, drag it over here again, and filter. So we're gonna filter the bus stops based on this layer. So let's run that. We'll remove this layer. So it's right here in the browser, it's, ta it's taking and extracting those stops that are within census tracts with high uh, transportation and housing needs. Okay, so here's our result. We're now down to 211 stops. So we've gone from, what was it, 2,500 stops, I believe, that we're not ADA compliant. We're down to close to 200 stops that we think have a pretty high need. So the next thing I wanna do is, I know we can't get to 200. I wanna prioritize these 211 stops. So I'm gonna create my own index. And this is going to be a really kind of a rough back of the napkin type of calculation. But I want to show you how you can do this stuff pretty easily right here within Insights. So I want to pull in some demographic information. So let's go to our action button. And I want to enrich these bus stops. And I'm going to pull in some data. So again, we have the data browser. Let's go to United States data. And let's search for a few different, a couple of different factors we want to look at. So let's pull in disability. So because we're looking at ADA compliance, I'm going to pull in the ACS data for households with one person with a disability and also let's look at, let's put in vehicle and the ACS data for households with no vehicles. Those are the two criteria I wanna look at for this. I'm gonna apply that. Here's the two factors. And then I'm gonna look at kind of a small area. Let's do a quarter mile here, so 0.25 miles. And I will run that. So what this is doing now is it's creating a new layer, which we have here, it's called Enrich One. I'm gonna get rid of this, we no longer need it. So this has all of our bus stop information, but it also has the number of households with a person, with at least one person with a disability, and the household with no vehicles available uh, within a quarter mile. Let's go to the uh, data table here. And here are those two. So it reached out to the web and added, enriched the data for me. I now have some variables that I can work with. So what I wanna do is kind of create a rough index off of these two things. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a new field. 
And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add the zero vehicle households and the households with a disability. And understand that these might, um, there might be some overlap here. Uh, a household that has no vehicle may, have, may also be the same household that has uh, no vehicle available. Um, and actually looking at this, I wondered if I grabbed, I think I grabbed the wrong field. Let me, I apologize, let me rerun this. I could tell because there was some fractions in there, which I shouldn't have. So let me put our bus stops back here. Let's enrich this again. And I'll be a little bit more careful. So let's do vehicle. ACS owner households with no vehicle. And let's do disability. And ACS households plus one disability. Okay. So the this is the reliability and the margin of error. And I might have grabbed one of those on accident um, previously. So let's apply that. Do our quarter mile again. Apologize for that. If you just bear with me here. We'll, we'll rerun re this. Get rid of. Enrich one, now we have enriched two. And let's look at this data table now. Okay, that's what I'm expecting to see. Whole numbers. Okay. Again, let's add let's add a new field. Let's create a calculation here. I want to add the disability households to the Vehicle, the households with no vehicle, again, knowing that we could be duplicating that, but that's okay by me. Those those would be important locations. Sorting these from high to low, the highest census track we have is 467. So let's, let's call that the curve that we're gonna grade off of. Let's create another field. We'll call that the index field. I'm sorry, I didn't rename anything yet. Just so we know what we're doing, let's, our previous field that we added, let's let's call that disable auto, so that way we know what we're looking at. This new field, close that, come back in. Clicking too many things at once. Add a field. We'll call this our index. And for the index, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that field we just created where we added those two factors together. I'm going to divide it by the highest number we had there, which is that 467. That's for us. And we'll run that. And now what we'll end with is this index where it has our highest need and then descending down to lower need. So now we can kind of start to rank those bus stops that have the highest need. So here we're looking at our enriched data layer. We can come into this index that we just created and filter on that. And now maybe we want to filter by census tracts that have an index that we created of, let's say 0 0.4 and up and apply that. And now when we look at this, we're down to 37 bus stops. So we went from 2,500 bus stops to, we'll say these are the 37 most important bus stops. These, are, these should be our top priority. And we did that based on a number of different steps, figuring out which ones were not ADA compliant, um, which ones had that high housing and uh, transportation need from the social vulnerability index, and then 
applying our own index, looking at some other census data that we brought in and were able to enrich. So now we have this, we can take this data and I could share this page with somebody and they could then take a look at this. Another key factor that I think is really important is it logged every step that we take. I don't know how many times I would do some analysis in my old job and somebody would want me to do the same analysis and I had no idea what I did to arrive at that conclusion. Here, this is logged all of your steps. And in fact, if you had a new set of bus stops, you could just pour that data in here and it would cal calculate that uh, new, new index for you right there. And then of course, we could take this layer that we created and we could share this out. So this would create a new layer. So we'll call this priority stops. Share that. And it's taking this data that right now only exists within Insights and has created a new web layer. So now if I go back to my ArcGIS online portal, go to my content, I have this new priority stops layer in here and now I can add this to a web map and put this into any type of a web application. Somebody could pull this into ArcGIS Pro and do further data analysis with it. But the point is, is now this is web enabled and we, have, we can now access this information really from anywhere on any device. And again, this is going to pull in all of the information from the, uh, that we had in Insights there. So to kind of summarize, uh, I just wanted to give you an idea of how you could use some of these web tools to do analysis. And again, I want to point out, we never opened any uh, software. I was doing everything within a web browser. So we're leveraging that geospatial cloud and doing all this through WebGIS. So just to close, I'm going to say go Blues. Game five's coming up tomorrow. So if there's any hockey fans out there, let's go Blues. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Terry. <laughs> All right, Jay. Thanks. Um, I put my you, in there. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to go back to your – there we go. So uh, I, I did want to point out, obviously, the analysis that Jay did was, was really focused on one set of uh, demographic characteristics. But if you think about all the rich data that you really have available and not only community analyst or business analyst, really to do a wide variety of, of different types of analyses. So, so uh, I, I did want to point that out. Those are really, really rich data sets that you have uh, available for a wide variety of, uh, of different types of applications. So with that, uh, let's go ahead. We can, we'll open it up uh, for questions and we do have uh, a number of questions and uh, so <laughs> actually uh, Jay someone is uh, saying let's go blues uh, to support your uh, Great. support you on that blue and fans here, we're, we're good to go yeah all right so um, <laughs> the, the first question really had to do with um, you know the sites uh, in St. Louis uh, mm -hmm. were those addresses were those uh, XY coordinates uh, I, you know, sort of, can you maybe briefly speak to the types of data that you can bring in to have it geocode on the fly like yeah. that? So the, to answer the question, it could be either. I was using an address, so this has the address, the city, and the state, and it was able to use that to geocode. If you had lat lawn, it would it would map that as well. Right. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, and then uh, there was another question uh, really about the CDC data, which uh, you may not be able to answer. It was really how often is the CDC data updated? And uh, Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think what I had there was from 2014. So admittedly, there's probably 2016 data available. Uh, but yeah, I, I can't really speak to how often they, they update that. Right. Okay. And um, so in your experience, uh, how many, you know, as, as both uh, you and Shayla go around talking to various transit agencies, how many of them are really aware of these additional data sets that, that they have available? Uh, how often do you see transit agencies really leveraging uh, the uh, business analyst data? It's a great question. Uh, I think oh, awareness is raising. Uh, I wouldn't say there's widespread knowledge of, of some of these tools, um, but as you can see, and I, I think we've really just barely scratched the surface 
of, of some of the data that's in here. Like you mentioned, Terry, there's hundreds of different data variables in here. Um, so so I, I think the idea is, and that's why I wanted to focus on the data in this webinar is to really raise that awareness. So uh, I would say it's, it's not widespread, but definitely knowledge of this is growing. Okay. And, um, you know, you were showing uh, U.S. examples. Uh, uh, how much of the similar data do we have uh, for Europe as well? There's quite a few data sets available for, for other countries outside of the United States, including Europe. Um, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't work with outside of the United States, so I don't have a whole lot of in-depth knowledge, but I do know that there are other data sets available for other countries, and it varies by country, but you may have noticed um, when I was in Insights and adding um, some, of, some of that enriched data, it asked me what country I was in. That's because there are a lot of, let me just go back here. So if we go back to enrich data, open the data browser. So there's data for for all the countries here. And it varies by country what data is there, but you know, you can select your country and you'll see what data is available for, for that. Right. And and we can follow up with that with that individual Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. that yeah. asked the question. Or, so, yeah. uh, figure out how to follow up and get more information. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then uh, there was a question really about the licensing. So other than business analyst, were there any other licenses that you used other than just uh, ArcGIS Online? So I use ArcGIS Online and you get a named user for every desktop you have or you can purchase additional users. And then uh, what I would call premium additions to ArcGIS Online would be the business analyst or community analyst and insights. So there, those would be two, two additional licenses that I use. Okay, and then there was another question about uh, did the uh, when you were using insights, uh, did the analysis and the data enrichment uh, did those uh, cost credits? Uh, maybe you could speak to to the you know credit. Uh, the, uh, yeah, it's a great question. So the the only thing I did within insights that used credits was data enrichment because that's reaching out to the web servers and pulling our demographic data. So that does consume some credits to, to, to run that process. Okay. And uh, let's see, we have, um, okay. And I think, I think at the moment uh, that, that uh, wraps up the questions. Uh, anything else, uh, Jay, that you want to add? Uh, it was a, a number of uh, people that said great, great job, great presentation. Awesome. I think they really well, I really appreciate that. I appreciate you sitting in. Uh, a question I usually get when I show this is, where is this data coming from? Can I learn more about it? So we do document this. this is, I'm on the community analyst page here. This talks about where the data comes from, how accurate it is, and actually uh, we, we did a, a blind test and our data is actually one of the most accurate or actually came out as the most accurate data source among five competitors. Um, and then also, let's see, where is it at? I think it's here. Yeah, this, this page here has a lot of information, uh, the loads. Um, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, about our demographic data, where it comes from, what sources we use, how we calculate things. So, um, you know, of course, people want to know where this data is coming from. You don't want to just click a button and assume it's all it's all there and it's all good. This this talks about where it comes from, so you can back up the the analysis that you're doing. And yeah, I, I would reinforce uh, through an independent evaluation. Uh, actually, this data was uh, the top ranked data among uh, all of uh, the sources. So it's. Uh, um, there's uh, so this uh, webinar will be actually available. It'll, uh, generally, it takes us a couple a day or two to put it up online, but uh, it will be uh, up on the website uh, within a day or two. Uh, and uh, we encourage you uh, to to share this with other other uh, folks and and uh, as well as. Uh, refer back to it uh, yourself. And uh, let's see, there's a, maybe a final question. Uh, can we use this software for demand response services uh, beside uh, the example with fixed routes? And um, yes, actually there's even kind of um, an online uh, routing and scheduling uh, component that you can access through ArcGIS Online as well. 
Uh, can you you want to speak to that at all, Jay? Or no, I, I, yeah, I think you, you you nailed it there, Terry. So you could use right. any data source you want within Business Analyst or Insights, and then like you mentioned, there are routing tools available in RTS Online. Yeah, both the routing and the scheduling so that with demand response, the issue is really that I have uh, a number of pickups and I want to optimize uh, and schedule those pickups so that I can uh, do it in the most uh, efficient way. Uh, so, all right. Well, with that, uh, we uh, thank everyone for being on the uh, webinar today and we encourage you to uh, uh, sign up for the future. As I said, we, we do have another one, I believe, coming June 26th uh, through our partner, with our partner, uh, City Labs, really talking about uh, the type of data and the analysis to really look at and better understand uh, our changing mobility patterns in our cities. So with that, um, Jay, thanks again. Great job. And, thank you, Terry, uh, and thank you, everyone, again. for attending. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, and with that, we'll close out uh, today's webinar. So thanks again. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.